Hello, my name is Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I'm here to talk to you about the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. This beautiful section that covers our Come Follow Me, sections 135 and 136, where we talk about 1844 and the events leading up to the death of our prophet. I'm going to have a part two on this section, uh, this, these sections, that will also talk about the splinter groups that came off from um, the church at the passing of our dear prophet Joseph. But for right now, let's look at some of these hard questions. Why did Joseph run for the president of the United States? And who was the Council of Fifty? And what was the legal basis for destroying the printing press? And was the Carthage imprisonment legal? What are all those details to unravel there? It's all a whole bunch of knots and difficulties. And um, many of these questions, um, you probably are, already found your answers to. But if there are others, I would encourage you to humbly and meekly dig deeper. The deeper we go with um, the Lord guiding us in our research to first-hand sources, I believe you can have your hard questions in church history answered by inspiration and by witnesses of the Spirit that our prophet, Joseph Smith, acted in behalf of God, and we continue to have had that blessing in our lives, even though we're human, even though we make mistakes, even though we say and do things that are uh, we regret later on, like Nephi's psalm in Second Nephi chapter 4, we can still praise the Lord for his mercy in allowing us to live and stumble through life as we go. Here's the timeline. 1843, Joseph asks five presidential nominees if they will protect the saints. December 28th, Joseph Smith prophesies that we have a Judas in our midst. In 1844, January 8th, William Law is removed from the First Presidency, and his brother, Wilson Law, is excommunicated. On January 29th, Willard Richards nominates Joseph as a candidate for the United States president. February, anti-Mormon meetings held in Carthage and Warsaw begin. February 20th, Joseph is called to a delegation to look for new gathering places in the West. He sends people to Texas and to California, and, you know, March 11th. 1844, the Council of Fifty is organized as a political adjunct to the church. March 26th, Joseph gave his last charge and the priesthood keys to the apostolic quorum. April 5th, 6th and 7th is general conference, and Joseph warns the apostates and gives the King Follett's funeral sermon. April 18th, there are 337 election or missionaries called, and the Warsaw Signal with its anti-diatribe begins. June 21st, William and Jane Law form their own church and plot to murder the Smiths. June 7th through the 27th, the Nauvoo Expositor is published, a thousand copies are distributed, and the city council discusses the, public, the destruction as a public nuisance, and Joseph is charged with treason and assassinated. All during this time, the temple continues to be the focus and its walls get higher every year. On December 10th, 1845 through February um, 1846, the endowments are given there. But during this last few months of Joseph's life, it is a major, major part of his focus. 1844, I mentioned, was an election year, and you get all these great cartoons when you get online and look up what the election was like that year between the different candidates. I just love reading them. I mentioned that Joseph wrote these five candidates, John Calhoun, Lewis Case, Richard Johnson, Henry Clay, and Martin Van Buren was running again for election. Three of the five responded. It was not President Van Buren. And remember, President Van Buren, when Joseph had gone earlier in November of 1839, remember President Van Buren had said, I will reconsider. But he did not reconsider, and he did not respond to Joseph's request, um, unfortunately. But three did. And one of those three, Henry Clay, said, should I be a candidate, I can enter into no engagements, make no promises, give no pledges of any particular portion of the people of the United States. If I ever enter into that high office, I must go into it as free and unfettered with no guarantees, but such as are to be drawn from my whole life, character, and conduct. What a difference between this election and our elections. You know, this is very, very different. But of those three that responded to Joseph, like Henry Clay, none were willing to um, promise help or protection for the saints. 
and Joseph was so discouraged as the um, the actions of John Bennett are um, rising and others are joining in who want to kill Joseph and kill this and wipe out the saints. And the saints are growing so fast. Joseph is even more worried about protecting them than he was in the Missouri days. So on January 29th, 1844, they have um, the leaders gather and they nominate an independent electoral ticket. Joseph does not run as a Whig or a Democrat. He runs as an independent. And Brother Hiram and John Taylor and John P. Green and Willard Richards are all part of this nomination process. And within a couple of days, a few days, by February 7th, 1844, we have a wonderful proposal drawn up, mainly written by W. W. Phelps, that gives the views and the powers and the policy of the government that will be Joseph's platform. And he wants to abolish slavery, to have some prison reform, to bring back, to restore the National Bank, to reduce congressional pay from $8 a day down to $2, to reduce the size of the House of Representatives down to two per million people. He wants to annex the regions of Oregon and Texas. Now, these are not the states. They're huge portions of land that bring together many, many states. He wanted to extend the United States from the East to the West Sea if the Native Americans gave consent and they could come up with some sort of an agreement. So there's his, the basic of his platform. But interestingly, the, um, the challenges of these, uh, the United States at this time to liberate the slaves was a very controversial topic. And Joseph came right out and said it. So he's already offending half the nation, as you know, um, were slave states. But Joseph said, let the nation purchase the slaves and set them free. Let the colored man owe his liberty to the government as a gift. And the money to purchase them can be realized from the sale of the political lands along its lines. So as more and more political lands are being sold off, the government is getting more and more money that they can then use to buy the slaves so that the um, owners can then either hire them as, as a hardworking uh, person of freedom or um, find another way of help on their lands and let the slaves be just uh, skilled laborers in any field that they want to in, in, go in. When Joseph looked at, um, began this process, he printed 150, no, 1,500, 1,500 copies of this to be distributed. And um, by April 15th, I mentioned earlier, there's 337 of these missionaries that are called out to um, publish this. And we who have a hard time with church and state say, what are you calling missionaries to be a political arm? Well, they knew they're, it's, it's basically volunteers who want to go help the political arm. But also remember, Joseph has this vision um, of the preparing for the second coming. And he, he doesn't see a separation of church and state as strongly as we do, or as we do. He sees more of the kingdom that Daniel prophesied of coming to pass. And on May 17th, Illinois and the U United States President Convention occurred, and Joseph joins it and is there. But as I look at all the, I looked at as many cartoons as I can, and nobody is including Joseph in their cartoons. The, the five main candidates are, or the eight main candidates, five main, I guess, are not there. But Joseph does organize in these first few months a council of 50 that take the arm of the political branch so that it's separate from the Quorum of the Twelve and the high priests and the deacons and the priesthood quorums or the Relief Society and the priestess and the um, Quorum of the uh, Holy Anointed. This is completely separate. He calls it the, quorum of the, the Council of the Fifty, not the Quorum, excuse me, the Council of the Fifty. And we know of meetings between March 11th and 16th. There may have been um, a few after that as well, but we know that there were meetings of this council during the month of March. The purpose of it was, as I mentioned before, to build up this kingdom uh, spoken of by Daniel, to take from Joseph Smith's shoulders the great weight of responsibility of the government and to place it on others so that this uh, he could remain as um, president of the church and others would help with the political arm. This is William Clayton, his, his, one of his wonderful secretaries who followed him around religiously and, and recorded for him um, the things that he needed to do and one of his um, personal assistants at that time. 
We know that there were flyers printed. Here's a copy of one here on my handout. Um, the prophet will meet you on Saturday morning, June 22nd, 1844. Um, he was running for president, and Sidney Rigdon was called as his uh, vice, was put in as his vice president. Now, this really surprised me, because Sidney had been so sick uh, for the last couple of years. But Sidney rose to the occasion and wanted to put forth his best foot and, and wanted this position, and the saints loved Sidney and um, asked if he could do this. However, you are not allowed to be in the same state if you're running for a vice president. So Sidney leaves to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, is there for most of the year. As these uh, missionaries are sent forth to the East Coast, I mentioned in the timeline that Joseph also called people to go search out a new place for the saints in the West. And uh, Lyman White was one of those, uh, the apostle, that would, would be soon to be apostle, um, to Texas, and other great men are sent elsewhere. And all of these are short-term missionaries just seeking refuge places for the saints because Joseph sees the handwriting on the wall and is afraid, and the Lord has inspired him, which is always the way it is. If you follow the prophet, the Lord will be inspired you to know where you can go for places of safety. It's exactly what was happening here. However, where to go in the West was unknown. Joseph said the saints can gather in the Rocky Mountains. He also said other locations. And so it was confusing. And as we talk in, our, in my next part B on this, the next lecture on um, um, the splinter groups, some of the splinter groups were formed because they were sure Joseph had said they wanted him to go to Texas or someplace like that. And so they took a group there. So unfortunately, it was not clear to Joseph exactly where, although he did say the tops of the Rocky Mountains, um, in one of the statements, but there were others that other people heard too. And are they hearing them correctly? Did Joseph mean that? If it's like me, I say a lot of things I don't mean. And that's why I appreciate um, your patience with me and hope that you read my handouts that are much more accurate. And I think I've mentioned before, my handouts are proofread by Susan Eastman Black and John W. Welch to make sure that the information I'm giving there is the latest research and up-to-date accuracy. On March 26th, 1844, Shortly after this, these missionaries are sent out, Joseph has a meeting with the Council of Fifty where he gives his, what has become known as his last charge. And this is when, in the presence of the Twelve and others, um, Joseph um, states that he wants the authority to be shared by the apostles and that he then reviews his life. He goes through all the suffering he's, he's had, and he tells the saints that he no longer is going to have to carry this burden. The Lord is telling him that his days are numbered and that he wants to make sure everyone understands in the presence of the Twelve and others, quote, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now place it upon you, my brethren, in this council, and I shake my skirts clear of all responsibility from this time forth. Now, this is not the only place that Joseph stated this. We have it in sections of the Doctrine and Covenants where he says the Quorum of the Twelve is equal in authority to the Quorum of the First Presidency. And um, we have it in other locations as well. But this was a much more public setting um, where it is current, it is present, it's March, it's just um, months before his martyrdom, and it's outlined there. However, we do not have anyone who wrote it in their journals that night. Benjamin Johnson's autobiography was written later when he records this event. And we have other people who are present who wrote it down, but they wrote it down later. And so it's a little bit delicate to say everyone was on the same page, everyone understood, everyone left that meeting knowing Joseph wants the Twelve to have full responsibility. Not quite that clear, um, because the history was not recorded that night. But I still say we have enough documentation that there's plenty of evidence that it was likely that those who had ears to hear, who chose to hear, heard that night. Also during this early spring period, between February and June, a group of those who were apostates from the Church began getting more and more angry. And it is tragic to me to see who they were. We have members of the First Presidency, and we have leaders in the church. We have good people who were led astray. But I want to stop first and um, let you know that these people made major decisions in their life that were wrong. Um, 
the member of the first presidency came to Joseph and said, I have committed adultery and I want to be sealed to my wife. I've heard about something. Um, I've heard that other people are being sealed. I want to be part of that. I want to have that experience. And Joseph said, if you have committed adultery, you are in no condition to be sealed to your wife right now. And he got so mad that he then begins attacking Joseph. And when he learns about plural marriage, he begins attacking plural marriage. But it's interesting to me to see the people that are, do, are attacking Joseph, the John Bennett's of the world and the law family, are people who have also um, lost their faithfulness. And in their attempt to repent, instead of taking the time that's needed to humbly recognize their need for um, complete repentance, they have pride come into their heart, they become selfish, and they attack Joseph on the very things as if he were guilty on the very things that they are. It's fascinating to me to see the people who attack Joseph on plural marriage often had extramarital relationships in an adulterous situations, not those who had been received the witnesses from God and were living a plural marriage situation as God had ordained. Tragic, tragic to see these people um, who had once been Joseph's friends now leaving the church. And as you can see, it's basically three families, the Laws, the Fosters, the Higbees, but more join later, unfortunately. But these initial ones began working with people like the scoundrel John Bennett and the um, anti-newspaper uh, writer um, William Sharp and, and start destroying Joseph. Now, this is all we knew about until uh, uh, we open up Lucy's memoirs. And Lucy adds a different side of this. She says that in addition to the uh, heretics who are attacking Joseph, we also have a little love triangle. Um, one of Hiram's daughter, Lavinia, was a wonderful young lady who was um, somebody named Joseph Jock Jackson wanted to marry her. And Hiram said, oh, no, you are not the kind of person that I want in my family. And in fact, um, my daughter is scared of you and wants to stay away from you. And she doesn't want you either. And Lucy's writing this all up. And she says that Jackson was so mad at Hiram that he goes to Joseph and says, Joseph, you've got to help me get this girl. And Joseph says, I'm not going to intervene. I, I would never have a girl marry someone without their permission. If they don't want it, the answer is no. And if my brother said no, the answer is no. Well, from that point on, Jackson said, I'm going to kill you guys. I'm going to kill you guys. And um, we have this account from Lucy, which is a little strange. But um, Lucy then, we also have in the minutes of the Nauvoo City Council, a reference that William Law... So Joseph's counselor, who became an adulterer, who then got mad at Joseph and apostatized and, and started his own church to kill Joseph. The purpose of his church was to kill Joseph. He's one of the splinter groups. He offered Jackson $500 to kill Joseph. And this is written in the minutes of the city council. So we have two accounts now of this story, and that's why I included it here. In the midst of all this is general conference. And as Joseph gathers with the saints, he is filled with the spirit and at one of the general conference sessions, he addresses uh, one of his dear friends, Brother King Follett. King is his first name, who was killed. He was crushed while digging a well, a very dangerous thing that everyone had to do when they were building their homes. Um, and Joseph, at this time, just like he did at Seymour Brunson's funeral when he talked about the Baptist for the Dead, at this April conference, as he is addressing the funeral of Brother Follett, he chooses to expand our understanding of the afterlife. And it became one of the most well-recorded sermons and one of the most comprehensive sermons. As I've taken it apart with each of the scribes' records separately, individually, and looked at each of the new doctrines, I realize that Joseph has already revealed this information. You find them already in the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants, or you find them already in his other sermons, but they aren't all put together in such a way to see the puzzle in its whole. And so this is one reason why this sermon has become so beloved by those of us who love the prophet Joseph and are ready for the meat of the gospel. He began speaking at three 
14, or three, a, a quarter past three, excuse me, according to the handwritten notes here by Willard Richards. And he wanted to speak relative to the death of Elder Follett, but he also went on and he wanted them to understand, quote, how God and how he comes to be God. We suppose that God was God from eternity and will be. Joseph said, I will take away the veil so that you may see. It is the first principle to know that we may converse with him and that he once was man like us and the father was once on an earth like us. So even though this information is in the book of Abraham in chapter four, as he talks about the intelligences, it is recombined in this way. This is Wilfred Woodruff's journal account that I had a hard time reading the handwritten words there. But in Thomas Bullock's account, he concludes by saying, I have intended my remarks to all, to the rich, to the poor, to the bond, to the free, to the great and the small. I have no enemy against any man, for I love all men, especially these, my brethren and sisters. And then he says something that has been taken out of context and used against Joseph. So I want to put it back in context of the King Follett's discourse. Joseph has already realized that his days are numbered. He's clearly given authority to the Quorum of the Twelve, and he says, You never knew my heart. No man knows my history. I cannot do it. I shall never undertake. If I had not experienced what I have, I should not have known it myself. I never did harm to any man since I have been born in this world. My voice is always for peace. I cannot lie down until my work is finished. Joseph has been um, called back and forth in legal battles, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I didn't want to discuss here. Um, And he's constantly going to courts and um, trying to be acquitted. And every time that he is actually in a hearing, they, they release him and realize that he's innocent. And I think this is what he's talking about here. But I also feel like he's saying, if I didn't live through receiving the golden plates and translating them, I would never have been able to. I, I, I understand why people can't believe that I'm opening up the canon after over 1,800 years of a closed canon or almost 1,800 years of a closed canon. I wouldn't believe that the father and son were separate if I hadn't seen it with my eyes. I, I understand why people don't believe me. You know, He's saying, if I hadn't lived it, I can understand why people have a hard time believing it. But he also testifies again that the promises that were given to him in his washings and anointings, that his life will not be taken if he is worthy of them, are here. And that's exactly the blessing that his father gave him, and that we talked about earlier when his father blessed him prior to his dad's death in 1840, that his life would not be taken until his mission was complete. Joseph was not to lead the saints left, the West. Someone else's was raised up for that responsibility. Joseph was to restore all things, and his work was almost finished. One of those court hearings that he went down to Carthage for was in May of 44, and he went down um, with um, bodyguards and with other people who were witnesses, and he was released again. Um, But as you can see, they start coming in more and more regularly, and um, I don't have them all written here on my slides, but I do on my handout, and once he's released from one court, someone immediately tries him on something else. And the work of the um, those that were fighting against him are just um, so thorough in making sure that they can capture him. And if they can't capture on one thing, they try another and they try another. Lucy recorded about these months here. She said, the apostates gathered strength until finally they established a printing press in our midst. And through this organ, They belched forth the most intolerable and the blackest lies that ever palmed upon a community. You know, I just love the the language of this day. You know, you can almost hear a little bit of the voice of people like Mark Twain. You know, this beautiful language of belching forth the most intolerable and the blackest lies. You know, we we don't write quite as um, extreme as they did then when they were, but we certainly appreciate to know how she felt. And this is Lucy's memoirs after the two boys, her two boys, had been killed. So on June 7th, what she was referring to was the Nauvoo Expositor. And in Nauvoo, on June 7th, 1844, it was published. 
And the Law Brothers are the editors, and they denounce Joseph, and they twist the truth and distort things that did happen and take them out of context until they are um, really quite damaging. And Joseph is very worried uh, about the safety of the saints, as well as the safety of his own family, most importantly. And so something has to be done. This was not a easy uh, publication, though. In order to get something published, you don't just go to Kinko's and get it Xerox, you know. William and Wilson Law, it's, a, it's estimated, spent $2,000 on this press and paper. And, you know, think of your day's labor uh, between a dollar and three dollars, depending on your skill level. Uh, think of your land uh, at a dollar or more an acre, depending on how, what kind of condition you're buying it in. And yet they were able to publish a thousand copies of it, and they mailed out immediately 500 of those copies. Um, and they called for a repeal of the Nauvoo Charter. They said, we live in Nauvoo, and we want the Nauvoo Charter repealed. Now, as I mentioned before, when John um, Bennett was writing much of this, John Bennett put so much power in the Nauvoo Charter so that he could take it on. He was the head of the Legion. He was the major mayor of the city. But Joseph agreed with it because Joseph wanted to, that protection for his city. Joseph went along with it because he saw the need. He was, unfortunately, deceived of the character of John Bennett. And John Bennett wanted more power and authority because he was a fraud. But many parts of the Nauvoo Charter were just copied from other cities. And if we look at the legal work across the early, uh, the Western states in early Americana, we see many places also having a their own um, posses, their own military units. And we find them, um, the pattern of the Nauvoo Charter actually following other states' charters. But it did have extra power in it, and that's why they're calling it to be repealed here. So, for three days, um, over a 14-hour period, so over these days, actually, I think it was on two days, over 14 hours, they, um, the city council met together to discuss the Nauvoo Expositor. What should we do? And um, during this deliberation, the city council um, went through the United States Constitution. They went through the Illinois Constitution. They went through the Nauvoo Charter. They tried to look at everything from a legal perspective and came to the conclusion that it was a public nuisance. And as a public nuisance, it could be removed from the city because it was a danger to the city. Um, I, I have heard scholars who looked into how many presses were destroyed in the first half of the 19th century in early Americana, Americana, and I was blown away how many were destroyed. There were 10 thrown in the Mississippi within a few years of Joseph's of living there. Um, so when we're back in Missouri and the mobs come in in Jackson County and throw our press out of the second floor and burn um, the the papers and destroy the Book of Commandments the best they can. Of course, we save some copies. Um, this was not unheard of. And um, Joseph City Council um, suggests that they will do it in an orderly fashion. It will not be a mob action. And the city marshal then goes over and reports to them and destroys the press and burns the papers that have not been mailed, the ones that are left there at the Nauvoo Expositor. But no buildings are burned. Nothing else is harmed. They just felt they were justified. And, you know, if I lived in that day and age, some things would be different. And I just have to tell you this little teeny analogy. In California, we walk across the street whenever it's safe. We expect to know when it's safe to walk across the street. In other states, you get labeled a jaywalker, or you can even be receive a fine by a policeman for jaywalking. In California, you would just laugh at that. We, we don't do that. And so don't look at the California jaywalking as a great sin. It's not a sin in California. It, we, we do it. It's safe. No one, it's, it's, it's okay. That's how it is in the 19th century. Don't look at destroying the press as a grave sin against the United States Constitution. This was part of their community. It was, it was, it, I, I, I think it was wrong, but they did not think it was wrong then. So I have got to step into their eyes and their history to see where they were coming from. They thought they were acting legally.
That's why they spent so long deliberating. That's why they did it through the channels of the government. They felt it was legal. Now, am I wrong in crossing the street anywhere I want? Yes. Um, but it was part, it's part of my culture in California. So I do it. Um, the destruction caused a horrendous whiplash. And the first thing that happened is Thomas Sharp, um, the editor of the Warsaw Signal, um, writes immediately in his newspaper, war and extermination is inevitable. We have no time for comment. Every man will make his own. Let it be made with powder and ball. And the last week of Joseph's life, I take day by day, um, these last two weeks, excuse me, of Joseph's life. On June 13th, the Nauvoo Municipal Court released Joseph on a writ of habeas corpus on the charge of riot. And it was unsubstantiated because the destruction had been orderly. It was not a riot. It was not by mob. And then the next day, June 14th, following his release, acting as mayor, Joseph then cleared the others that were charged. Now, of course, this com combination of church and state and Joseph being a leader in this community made everybody very upset. And how do you have right to do these kind of things? We want you to go to a court that is, has nothing to do with members of your church and you be tried there. So on June 17th, Joseph agreed um, that the city council and Joseph went for a hearing with a justice of the peace named Daniel Wells, who was not a member of the church at that time. Um, and he just charged both of them. He said, you had a legal right to destroy this to a degree. Um, and he acquitted them. This is very interesting. Other judges at this time did not hold them accountable when they looked at the evidence. However, the next day on June 18th, um, there are so many threats on the city of Nauvoo that Joseph does something else that offends now the governor of the state. And um, the threats of burning and raping the women and um, and are so severe and so real to those saints who have already gone through Missouri just a, within a decade before that Joseph calls out the militia to protect the city. Now, in our day and age, we would call out the police and we would um, ha form a protection around our city. Um, but they don't have that. They have the militia and Joseph calls it out and um, to protect the city from the mobs. And that action became very upsetting because he, he called it as martial law. The governor form writes to tell Joseph that he's going to face charges, even though the charter of Nauvoo allowed for this, the governor felt he had overstepped his bounds. And the governor um, also, as you know, was in cahoots with those who were trying to kill Joseph. A few days later, on June 22nd, Governor Ford wrote again and told Joseph that he must appear in court before a very hostile community in Carthage, where feelings against the Mormon were very severe. And so Joseph says, I would like to get some legal help on this. I don't want to be seen in Carthage. It's just like for the whole ye two years before, as they kept trying to pull Joseph back down to Missouri to be tried there for the Boggs case, and Joseph said, I will be charged, I will be tried here, but I will not go back there to be charged, because I'm, I know I'll be lynched. And he says the same thing here, you know, do I really have to go to Carthage? So he goes to get some legal help, and he and his bodyguard and dear friend, young, 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 Orrin Porter Rockwell, um, and Willard Richards, early Sunday morning, leave Nauvoo and go across the river into Iowa to get legal help outside of the city, outside of the state, from, um, to hear what they can do nationally. He makes arrangements to meet with these lawyers the next day, on Monday, um, on this Sabbath. But he also, while he's there, receives letters from many members. Um, Orrin Porter Rockwell is going back and forth with letters and messages, and other people are coming and going. And um, it's really a very, very busy Sabbath day. And Hiram tells Joseph, as they're over in Ohio, oh, Iowa, excuse me. Hiram heard that the governor had threatened to burn the city if the prisoners were not given up. Joseph thought that if he went back, they should die, but he was willing to die to save the city. This is all according to, to Lucy Mack's memoirs. But in some of the letters that came back and forth that Sabbath, um, several people called Joseph a coward to go over there. They didn't realize he was going over to get legal help. They didn't realize all the ramifications of, you know, nothing is, is simple. Uh, the older we get, we realize life is not black and white. Life is full of living color. 
everything is a spectrum of color and we have to be gentle and careful and not be judgmental. Um, but Emma sends a letter and says, come back. And Joseph, after reading all these letters um, carried back by Orrin Porter Rockwell, he says, if my life is of no value to my friends, it is of none to myself. And he turns himself back in. And supposedly, Emma realized that night that she had just asked him back for his deathbed. And as soon as she arrives, she says, oh, Joseph, I, I didn't realize how bad it was. I, I didn't know. You'd better, you better go back. And he said, no, I, I want to stay and I want to bless all of my children. So he returns back late, late, late night. And the next day, or the evening of the 23rd of June, excuse me, Sunday evening, he is able to bless his children. And that time, remember, um, Julia, the adopted twin, uh, the Murdoch twin, is already 13 years old. And then we have Joseph III at 11, Frederick is eight and six and four. You know, they're, they're very young. And Emma is expecting, um, as you remember. Joseph is um, ready to be taken captive the next morning. And Emma says to him as he's leaving, Joseph, you're coming back. And Joseph says to Emma, I am going as a lamb to the slaughter, yet I have a conscious void of offense towards God and towards man. And so at 6.30 in the morning, he is taken by the um, court system, the, those that were hired to take him down um, to leave Nauvoo. But as they leave, as they go down this 23 miles to Carthage, Joseph learns that the governor is going to come back and get everybody in Nauvoo to give up their arms and to have the ammunition removed from the whole city. And Joseph says, there is no way that they're going to do that without a fight. We have gone through too many fights in too many places to ask them to give those up um, peacefully unless I tell them to. So Joseph turns around and says, I will tell them to give up their arms, but um, it's the only way. So he returns and that Monday morning he goes back and sees Emma one more time and has the saints um, turn in their arms. He, he, the, the Nauvoo Legion and turns in their arms, and the city is left without protection. As he goes back and talks to the legion briefly, he tells them, boys, if I don't come back, take care of yourselves. I'm sure in Joseph's mind, he knew he was going to die. He says it three or four times as he, to Emma, to the legion, and it's recorded elsewhere as well, especially when he gets down to Carthage, he knows. Uh, it's recorded multiple times. Um, his heart was full. And as he's leaving the second time, Emma says, I would like a blessing. And the posse that's taking him down says, we don't have time for this. And Joseph says, Emma, you write your own blessing and I will sign it. And I feel like I understand Emma's heart better at this time, better than any other time in her life because of this document, because of this blessing that she writes out. And feel free to read the whole thing if you'd like. Um, but I just have pieces of it here that I'd like to read to you. I desire the Spirit of God to know and understand myself. I desire a fruitful and active mind that I may be able to comprehend the designs of God and wisdom to raise her children. I desire with all my heart to honor and respect my husband, ever to live in his confidence, and by acting in unison with him, retain the place which God has given me by his side. I desire that whatever may be my lot through life, I may be enabled to acknowledge the hand of God in all things. Isn't that beautiful? So that night, Monday night, um, Joseph arrives late in Carthage and he sleeps in the Hamilton Hotel. 17 friends have come down with him in the city council who are also on um, in needing to be seen by a court because of their work in the decisions on destroying the press. The next morning, Tuesday, um, there's a mob outside of the hotel, and the city um, council in Carthage realizes that Joseph is not safe at all, and they move him to Carthage jail for greater protection. Governor Ford promises Joseph and these 15 friends that they will have more safety in Carthage. And so they move over into the prison, and the city council is freed on bail. They push the court date way out until October. Um, when a circuit court will happen to come back around town again. So they say, go home, you're all fine. But many of those 15 friends don't come, go home all the way. 
Um, Joseph gives some errands, go get this attorney, go do this, go get us some food. Um, and they come in and out of the jail over the next couple of days at different times. And Joseph and Hiram are jailed. Um, um, they're all released, and then Joseph and Hiram are jailed again by a Methodist minister who is also a justice of the peace, and he writes another um, writ and claims that um, Joseph has committed treason, so then he cannot be released on bail. As they go, enter into the jail, here's a little cutaway for you to see on my um, slides. It's 38, excuse me, 34 by 28 feet. The walls are two and a half feet thick. Up in the attic, there's a very dark dungeon where criminals were kept. But on the second floor, there's a debtor's prison where the 10 men slept that night. Downstairs is where the jailer and his family live. The jailer has eight children. They live down there. And they also have an upstairs bedroom for the jailer. So the jailer invites Joseph to breakfast together. And after that, he says, you don't, you don't need to stay in the debtor's prison. So he's short time up in the dark dungeon. They spend the night in the debtor's prison. They have breakfast. The jailer gets to know them. He says, why don't you just take my bedroom? And the jailer gives Joseph his bedroom for his last night of his life. Um, and then um, the trial is set for June 29th. But of course, we know that Joseph was martyred on June 27th. This jailer, George Stigel, I, I really admire. I said eight children. I meant seven. Excuse me. He and his wife make up the eight other people that are living in this house, as well as these people. And I thought, what a tragic place to raise children with death and having to be part of all of this. So hard on these little children. But here's a picture of the dungeon upstairs with no light. And here's a picture of the debtor's prison where they spent the night of June 25th. Now, 10 men slept in this debtor's cell with Joseph. And here's a picture of where Joseph had breakfast the next day with um, the jailer and his family and um, became good friends with them. On June 26th, between 9.30 and 10.15, Joseph and Governor Ford met together. And this is when the governor promised them that he would protect them and that he would escort Joseph back to Nauvoo. So Joseph writes a letter to Emma immediately saying, I'm coming back. And the governor is going to escort me with his military unit. This is on the 26th. But by the afternoon, the governor has taken the military and left. And um, Joseph is called to court. And Joseph is told to come outside and go across the street over to the courthouse. And by this time, Joseph knows he's going to die. There's a huge group outside of people who are antagonistic to him. And he goes right out and links arm with the head of the mob that he's been watching out the window and says, escort me over to the courthouse. And then on the other side of Joseph are um, his brother Hiram. And, you know, the, it, it's just an amazing thing to imagine what's happening here on this uh, afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, as they walk across the street. But that evening... Um, they're all back in the, in the, they come from court and they're back safely. And Hiram begins reading the Book of Mormon aloud. And Joseph then preaches to the guards. And he, I'm, I'm just amazed. He is such a missionary. He never loses a moment to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In case there is someone there like Alma Sr. on King Noah's court who had a soft heart or who would be able to repent and change their heart. And there were some who did, but most did not. And that night, um, as they were on the floor in that debtor's prison, um, Joseph leans over to John Fulmer and puts out his arm and says, use my arm as a pillow. And this is where he gave um, that sweet prophecy to Dan Jones. Um, there was some shooting. There was, they heard some people running up the stairs that night and some gunshots that woke them up. And Joseph leaves the bed where he'd been sleeping. There was a one bed in the debtor's prison, and he and Hiram were on that bed. And when the gunshots go off, he gets out of the bed and he goes down to the ground and he's, um, um, shortly after that, he leans over to Dan Jones and says, are you ready to die? And um, Dan Jones says, oh, I'd be honored to die beside you. And, and Joseph says, no, you will not die. You will live and serve in Wales. You know, there are so many prophecies that Joseph gave. Uh, and some claim that there are prophecies that Joseph gave that were not fulfilled. But as I have studied those, they are prophecies that were contingent upon other people's righteousness and they did never came to pass because of the mistakes that we made. We always have agency. The Lord can give prophecies, but we have to fulfill our part of the bargain. And um, Dan Jones' prophecy was fulfilled, and he became a great missionary. 
Thursday morning, the 27th, is when Governor Ford leaves, not not before on, on Wednesday. It's Thursday morning that the governor leaves and without the prisoners, and he takes the state militia, uh, most of them with him. He disbands them. The only people he leaves to protect against the mob are eight Carthage Grays. And the Carthage Grays were, ups, uh, were against uh, the Mormons anyway. And here's a wonderful uniform of the Carthage Grays. Isn't this elegant? Isn't that beautiful? Looking at the uniforms of the, that day. But one of the officers of the Grays uh, was heard to say by an eyewitness who recorded it, we've had too much trouble to bring old Joe Smith here to ever let him escape alive. Unless you want to die with him, you better leave before sundown. And most of the people that were coming in and out of the jail did. There were only four that remained that Thursday afternoon. It was a very hot day. And unless you've been in the Midwest um, in a muggy state or in a muggy state where there's um, extreme heat um, in a second story window, uh, a second story room, you don't appreciate how, how miserable that must have felt especially if you're wearing the clothes that they wore in those days, long pants and long shirts. And on that afternoon, Joseph and Hiram, as well as John Taylor and Willard Richards, remain in the jail and are able to spend the last few hours of Joseph's life together and Hiram's life together. There was a famous new hymn. It was came over from England, and it talks about a young man who was called a poor wayfaring man. And as it ends in the end, um, it reminds me of the scripture, if you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And it turns out to be the Savior. And this became a very popular hymn amongst the saints and across other um, religious congregations as well. And John Taylor had a lovely voice. And to pass the time, he sang this hymn all the way through. And Joseph asked him to sing it again. And he said, I don't feel much like singing and actually, I don't know if it was Joseph who asked him again, but somebody asked him again. He said, I don't feel like much like singing. And Joseph said, well, just start and, and it'll come back again and you'll feel it. And I feel like music is one of the best ways to bring the Spirit of the Lord into a room. And I presume that it had the same effect there on those men to calm their hearts and, and, and realize that the Lord is in charge, that even if our leaders are destroyed, they are just mortal leaders. We come and go. It is the Lord who's in charge of the church. And it, it provided a focus on our Savior that allowed them to have peace in their hearts again. But that afternoon, the Warsaw militia attacked, and the Carthage Grays gave a token resistance, but their guns were only loaded with gunpowder, with no bullets. They had nothing there except for noise. And so um, they didn't get in too much trouble, but it, the evidence has shown otherwise. About five o'clock in the afternoon, between 150 and 200 um, people swarmed, the, and we started hearing the gunshots. And as you know the story, um, Willard Richards, the largest man in the room, it has been prophesied that he will remain unscathed, and that is exactly what happens. Hiram is first shot, and um, the artwork that we have of this period describes um, much of it incorrectly, but hopefully you could read some of the accounts to get the accurate stories that John Taylor um, is wearing a watch. The, the bullet did not go through the watch. The watch stopped at 516 when he fell and the crystal broke. There's no bullet all the way through it. But John Taylor was wounded in the hip and in his leg. And he had actually, I think, four balls. One was in his hand. And um, he um, lived to be our third prophet of the church. But as you know, out of these um, 35 bullet holes that were seen in, in the room by archaeological evidence, four of them killed Hiram and Joseph. And as they fell, the mob dispersed. That's all they were after. And um, somebody yelled, the Mormons are coming. And everyone scattered. Um, that night... Um, the jailer and the, with the help of Willard Richards um, and others who were close by, they were able to keep dear John Taylor alive. And they brought in a doctor who, with a pen knife, cut out the bullets uh, from his hand. And um, he said, John Taylor has nerves um, of steel or something like that. It's this famous quote that I'm not remembering correctly. I'm sorry. But the first person on the scene from Nauvoo, who had left hours before, um, was their brother, Samuel. 
Smith. And he then uh, organizes um, for the next day two wagons with eight guards and Willard Richards and helping with one and um, to take the two bodies back up to Nauvoo before any harm is done to them. Any more harm was done to the bodies. And because of the heat, they layered down, they layered a, a beaver um, a blankets and then skins and then um, branches to provide shade. And when the bodies arrived late that night, um, they were taken into the home for the family to see. And then the saints were told, there was thousands of saints had gathered, and the saints were told that they could come the next day for a viewing. And on June 29th, on Saturday, the funeral sermon was uh, given by W. O. Phelps. And as we know, it's section 138. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world, than any other man that has ever lived in it. In the short space of 20 years, he has brought forth the Book of Mormon and the doctrine. And it goes on and on. As you know, I better stop. But I used to think that was an exaggeration. That was a hyperbole of a, of a message given at a, at a funeral sermon. But as I left seminary and grew in maturity over the last few years, I have prayed about this. And I believe that this section is accurate. As I look at what Joseph was able to restore and what the Lord wanted the saints to have, Joseph has done more by restoring the Savior's sealing ordinances. And I pray that Joseph's life can be held in memory as a servant of God. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>